Hi everyone, welcome to the 100th episode of the Mummy Movie Podcast, where, voted for by my followers on Instagram, we shall be looking at the 2022 film Uncharted. This film stars Tom Holland, Sophia Taylor Alley, Mark Wahlberg and Antonio Banderas. So, just for anyone who isn't aware, this film is actually an adaption of a video game series of the same name. A video game series that just so happens to be one of my favourite of all time, so it's fair to say I know it pretty well. Just before we begin, I want to give a special shout out to a uh, a $5 a month member of the Mummy Movie Podcast Patreon page, (laughs) Um, Mother Trucker 69 I think I can just about get away with saying that name. Um, in my mind, I, I've got Mother Trucker 69. I've got you down as um, a wizened old um, sort of trucker woman, 69 years of age. You travel the uh, the roads, occasionally picking up people who, who uh, tell your, your your road stories to, give you, give you know, like life advice, that kind of stuff. I'd, I'd imagine that's why you're called Mother Trucker 69. I, I'm going to guess I'm correct on that. Anyway, in terms of the format for the episode, it's going to be the same as usual. We shall start by looking at the history the film presents, and then I shall simply review the film and rate it out of 10. But before then, as usual, it is time for the dramatic intro. Right, you and your older brother were raised in a convent. You spent much of your time sneaking out at night and getting into trouble. One night, you both get caught trying to steal a treasure map from a museum, and your brother has to flee, leaving you to fend for yourself. As you grow up, you are forced to undertake petty crime to make ends meet. Then one day, you are approached by another thief who offers you the chance to go on an adventure of a lifetime. You agree. And before you know it, you are crossing between country after country in search of a long-lost treasure. However, in order to find this treasure, you have to travel into areas not on the map. You have to cross into lands and seas uncharted. Right, so on to the history section. I should probably just say to begin with, as I usually do with these kind of episodes, I am an Egyptologist. As such, um, we are looking at a subject here that's not really in my area. Essentially, most of the information here is on 16th century naval history. That being said, I have done a lot of research and in all honesty, I I actually found studying this quite interesting. It was actually quite nice looking at something that wasn't ancient Egypt for for a change. You know, it was a a bit of variety, if you will. Anyway, um, let's get on with it. Near the beginning of the film, a young Nathan Drake claims that Ferdinand Magellan was the first man to sail around the globe. His brother, Sam, then contradicts this and says that Ferdinand Magellan died on the trip and it was actually his captain who completed the journey. This is all pretty accurate. Essentially, Ferdinand Magellan was a Portuguese explorer um, during the 16th century, and although he did not make it around the entire globe himself, he and his crew were the first Europeans to navigate to Asia through the Pacific Ocean. Essentially, at this time, when setting off, most sailors would sail eastward as some, there was more established trade routes in that direction. Ferdinand Magellan instead travelled west through stormy seas. Now, you might be asking why he did this, and, well, it was essentially because he was looking for Malaccas, otherwise known as the uh, the Spice Islands. He wanted to find these islands in order to set up a trade route, as they were abundant in spices such as mace, nutmeg, cloves and pepper. Basically, they were highly profitable opportunities for, for trade. And, you know, I should probably just say it's worth noting that at this time, 
This route was uncharted waters. <laughs> uncharted. Um, as such, the geographical knowledge of the area was, was highly inaccurate. Sam is also correct that Ferdinand Magellan died on the trip, and it was actually his captain, Juan Sebastian Alcano, and the remaining crew who managed to circumnavigate the, the globe. Basically, when they arrived in the Philippines, and honestly, if you want to see how far that is, just go to Google Maps and look at where Portugal is, and then look at where the Philippines is. It, it's literally insane. Bearing in mind they were travelling west and had to go around America as well. Like, we are not talking about an easy feat here. I should probably just say, the main source for this next part of the story is a um, scholar and explorer who was part of the voyage named Antonio Pigafita. Although Antonio was an eyewitness to a lot of the, the following events, he also had his biases and, you know, he wasn't there for absolutely everything. So just, just bear that in mind. Anyway, when they arrived in the Philippines, Ferdinand Magellan anchored at an island named Homonhon, I, I think it's pronounced, and from here he was guided to, to Cebu, where he met the, the king of Cebu and his queen. And, well... <laughs> Because it was the, the 16th century and it was basically what Europeans did back then, he converted the king and queen to Catholicism and baptised them because, uh, of course, he did. <laughs> Due to the, the influence of this king, many of the local chieftains um, on the nearby islands also converted to Catholicism. However, one chieftain named Lapu Lapu, who was on the island of Mactan, refused and he also was quite resilient to the idea of, you know, colonisation. How absolutely dare he. Outrageous. <laughs> uh, where still, another chieftain on the island of Macton, named Zula, claimed that he was not able to send the bulk of his tributes to um, Ferdinand Magellan because Lapu Lapu was, was stopping it. It is worth noting again, this is the account of Antonio Pigafetta, um, it is also worth noting that this is the only mention he makes of Zula. Some modern scholars have even speculated that, well, maybe both Zula and Lapu Lapu were working together. Essentially, Zula may have been trying to lead Ferdinand Magellan, you know, into some kind of like ambush. Basically, the thing that needs to be realised here is that a lot of the finer details are, are very uncertain here. Either way, according to um, Antonio Pigafita, Zula asked that Ferdinand Magellan send his entire fleet to help him. Instead of doing this, Ferdinand instead sent 60 men led by himself. However, the conditions of the, the kind of like battle and the, like the area around it were far from ideal. First things first, either due to sort of coral reefs or rocks, the ships were not able to pull up close enough to the shore you know, to use supportive fire for Ferdinand Magellan and his men. Ferdinand and his men also had to wait ashore for the same reason, and by the time the battle had actually begun, he was only attacking with about 49 men rather than the original 60. According to the, admittedly, almost certainly exaggerated accounts of the battle, these 49 men had to fight 1,500 of Lapu Lapu's men. As the enemy charged, Ferdinand Magellan and his men shot at them with crossbows, but apparently the warriors of the army were incredibly dexterous and able to easily dodge these. Sounds a bit like the Matrix to me. The warriors of the island attacked Ferdinand and his men. However, due to the Spaniards being well protected by corsets and helmets, there were only a handful of fatalities. Nevertheless, the, the men of Ferdinand Magellan were becoming increasingly demoralised. Kind of, as you'd expect, I suppose, if you're being attacked by a huge army of warriors. <laughs> then, according to Antonio's account, the worst strike of the battle happened. A fatal strike. Ferdinand Magellan himself was hit in the leg by a poisoned arrow. As a result... Ferdinand ordered most of his men to retreat, whilst he remained with either six or eight to hold the warriors of Lapu Lapu back. Ferdinand Magellan died, but in doing so, he helped his men get away. 
Or so Antonio's account tells us. Realistically, we can't know for certain that this is the way it went down, and most modern scholars throw a certain level of doubt on the end of this story. However, Ferdinand Magellan does seem to have at least died during this battle, and in fact the victory of Lapu Lapu was so successful that the island of Mactan was not colonised for over 40 years. Also, on Ferdinand's death, it is noticeable that the king of Cebu, you know, the one who had previously converted to, uh, to Catholicism, quickly denounced his new faith. It's not entirely known why he, he suddenly had a change of heart, but there's a good chance that this was due to, um, you know, dissatisfaction over Spanish rule, conflicts with other native groups over, you know, the sudden change, and the wish to rule over his own people. There's also a good chance that he had, you know, just been using the Spaniards to take out his, uh, his rival chieftains, such as Lapu Lapu. When this failed, why on earth would he not denounce his faith and try to rid himself of Spanish rule? Either way, as said earlier, the expedition then left the Philippines with Juan Sebastian Alcano now in charge, and eventually they made it all of the way around the globe. Going back to the film, Sam also claims that Ferdinand Magellan's map was the first ever map of the entire world. If I'm honest, I, this is completely incorrect, and you only need to think about it for a second to see why that would be. For instance, in the 6th century BC, the Babylonians attempted to draw a map of the world, so that, that predates this by thousands of years. And okay, fair enough, this map was hardly accurate, and you could argue that Maybe the film means uh, an accurate map of the world, but at the same time, how do you quantify that? Maps are constantly getting more and more accurate as time goes on, so at what point does that start? For instance, Pomponius Mela, a, a Roman geographer, drew a map in 43 AD, and then in 150 AD, a Greco-Roman man named Ptolemy drew a, a slightly more accurate map. It was still very flawed, but for instance, when looking at the map, Italy is pretty easy to spot as it, well, looks more or less like Italy looks on maps today. Then many people after Ptolemy took influence from him. For instance, a man named Andrea Bianco took influence from Ptolemy, as did another man named, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing this correct, Henricus Martellus Germanus. Both of these examples are well over a thousand years after Ptolemy. So the point is, to say that Ferdinand Magellan's map was the, the first map of the entire world is pretty much wrong in, in every single way. Not only had maps of the world been, you know, around for thousands of years, but they had also been getting gradually better with time. So yes, maybe you could argue that this was the, the best map of the world up until that point, but that's not what's been argued here. Anyway, let's um, end on a slightly, you know, like, fun note. At one point in the film, Nathan Drake is working in a bar when a woman asks him to make her a Negroni, so some type of, you know, a cocktail. He then claims that this cocktail was first made in 1919 by Count Camillo Negroni, who then swapped soda water in his usual drink for gin. This is incorrect. The origins of the Negroni are actually not entirely known, but they seem to originate from the 1920s. So, overall, unsurprisingly I suppose, this film is pretty rough and ready when it comes to history. It claims that Ferdinand Magellan had the first, you know, map of the world, and claims that the origins of the Negroni are, are certain. However, on the plus side, it does get some, you know, kind of vague details of Ferdinand Magellan's journey correct. For instance, the fact that Magellan died on the journey, and it was actually his captain who completed the journey around the globe. So although far from perfect, the film does at least uh, serve as a decent jumping off point when looking at a very interesting area of history. Okay, so on to the review. To start with, I will admit, although the, the physics in the opening scene, and many of the scenes after that, for that matter, were ridiculous, I actually quite enjoyed it on a kind of like, you know, 
dumb fun level. Basically, the film starts with Nathan Drake, so Tom Holland, hanging off of a string of boxes that have fallen out the back of an aeroplane. <laughs> and, and basically, he's half like crawling, half jumping and running up of, up these boxes to get back to the plane as he's having to fight a load of bad guys at the same time. It is incredibly silly as, well, as may shock you, this is definitely not how physics works. <laughs> But in all honesty, not only is this a film after all, so essentially who cares that much, but also it's a film based off of a video game and I could very much see this being, you know, like a level in one of the games. In fact, now I think about it, it is literally one of the levels in the game. I'm pretty sure this happens in the third game just before he lands in the desert. So actually, silly yes, but also, you know, a nice nod to the game, also yes. And in fact, that does lead me quite nicely to my next point. Because there are a lot of elements borrowed from the various games here. The very next scene, for instance, has a young Nathan Drake and his brother, and it shows them basically breaking out of the, the convent where they're being raised and sneaking into a museum. Again, this is really similar to some of the flashback scenes in the fourth game, and well, I loved those scenes in, in the game. They added a, a level of emotion and also gave a lot of information about the, the relationship between, you know, Nathan and Sam. And when it comes to the film, I also think it did exactly the same hit thing here. You know, it, it added emotion to the scene, so, so they did a good job. They effectively filled out Nathan Drake's backstory. Though, I will admit, one niggling negative here, just quickly... It may be wince a little bit that they changed elements of the story here. So, for instance, during this film, they claimed that Sam didn't really ever visit Nathan after escaping the convent. Anyone who has played the fourth game will know that this isn't the case because, well, essentially, Sam was supposed to come back to see his brother in secret from time to time. Maybe this is me being a bit picky, but we are talking about a series that is quite near and dear to me. I, I love this series. But nevertheless, look, I will still stress that this scene did genuinely make me feel sorry for Nathan Drake, so it did it did succeed regardless. Another scene pretty much ripped directly from Uncharted 4 was the, the auction scene. Basically here, Nathan and his, I suppose, kind of mentor, uh, Sully, need to get a, a cross from an underground auction. However, amazingly, they do not have three million dollars to spare, so they have to try and steal it. This, unsurprisingly, leads to several fights and, you know, hijinks and shoes. I did actually quite like this scene. Here we are also introduced to two of the main villains, Santiago, played by uh, Antonio Banderos, and Braddock, played by Tati Gabriel. So, essentially, as well as moving the story forward here, we are introduced to several new characters. But by the same token... I will say that the, the level in Uncharted 4 was undeniably better, and even the auction house was more impressive, like it was in a more impressive location in the game as well. So for instance, the one in the film is just kind of in the middle of a city, where the one in the game's like perched on the edge of a cliff, and it looks absolutely spectacular. I suppose though, that wouldn't have really made sense for the, um, the point this was in, you know, in the film. And there are also time constraints with filming as well, admittedly. Like, this film was just under two hours long, and that was the appropriate length, so maybe it was a, you know, a worthwhile sacrifice. As kind of already mentioned, another small positive, I guess, is that Antonio Banderos is introduced in this scene, and I'm always just kind of happy to see him, so I'll give the film something for that. Finally, in terms of nods to the games... We do actually get a cameo from Nolan North here, who, who was basically the man who voiced and gave the motion capture for Nathan Drake in the games. That's just generally nice to see. Like, that, that's all I'm going to say about that. Moving away from the nods to the games, however, um, I also quite like that the, the film has a sort of national treasure feel to it at times. You know, like the, the national treasure with Nicolas Cage. I know those films are for everyone, but I will admit I quite like them. Basically, the first, like, sort of, like, half of the middle of the film plays off like one of those, those films with Nathan, Sully, and the other main character, Chloe, going between countries following various clues. 
this was a lot of fun and it kept my interest where I feel like other films would have started to lose me a little bit. Finally, for the positives, I will admit, I kind of did enjoy the end, though it was stupid beyond belief. Right. So basically, they find the treasure in some old ships, and then the bad guys arrive and airlift the ships out of the cove where they are. This essentially leads to a scene where two 16th century ships are flying through the air as Nathan Drake and Sully half swashbuckle, half brawl their way through multiple enemies as they try to hijack the, the helicopters carrying them. Like, a, like, I will admit, my general education, as, as well as my time spent in archaeology, I will admit, it's kind of ruined these scenes for me a little bit, because, well, believe it or not, airlifting to 16th century ships out of a cove with without doing any sort of like research whatsoever beforehand and then smashing them together in the sky it's not particularly great you know that's not great archaeological practice but by the same token if i didn't know anything about history or you know i didn't care about it as much i'd probably just be watching this scene going ah hey, cool flying ships so i Sure, I guess. I suppose I'll, I'll give the ending to this film a mixed response, but I, I do definitely get why people would find this a lot of fun. <laughs> but anyway, now unfortunately, there are, there are also some just genuine negatives here. First of all, I, I really hate the decision to make this into a prequel to the games, and I don't think they implemented this particularly well. Like, it is supposed to be a prequel, but it's set in the modern day. And I guess this is me being a bit picky, especially as this didn't bother me with other prequel like films and series. For instance, I, I very much enjoyed the, the first half of Smallville, you know, before it started going completely downhill. Um, Smallville's young Superman, for anyone who doesn't know. But for whatever reason, I found it hard to forgive this here. I think it's partly because I don't believe they originally wanted to make this into a prequel, I, I will stress, I don't know this for certain, but I feel the only reason they made it into one was because they wanted Tom Holland on board and he was essentially too young to play Nathan Drake, you know, the one from the games anyway. But also, in the games, we actually see Nathan Drake and Sully meet for the first time and they've just completely rewritten that here. And look, I will stress, I know that's me being very picky, this is an adaption of the video game, it's not maybe supposed to be exactly the same story but i don't know i just don't like it i just don't like that decision but anyway going back to uh the decision to cast tom holland look i don't dislike tom holland as an actor i know there are some people out there who, who don't like him and claim that he's he just plays the same character in every film to be honest i'm not even going to you know deny that but i also don't think that's necessarily a, a terrible thing you know, at least you're good at playing one role, and I actually do think he's got a certain level of charm to him. Like, like for instance, I enjoy the uh, the films of Dwayne Johnson. He only really plays, like, one role, but ultimately, it means you know what you're getting, and there's something quite comforting about that. I'd say the same for Chris Pratt, for that matter. But by the same token, partly because of this, I just don't think Tom Holland was a good pick for Nathan Drake. On the upside, I suppose, Nathan Drake does have a, uh, a slightly nerdier side, and I think Tom Holland portrays that really well, but he's also supposed to be rough and ready, uh, clearly inspired by Indiana Jones, and Tom Holland just can't really pull that off. So, kind of as I just said, I do like Tom Holland in some roles, but this just isn't one of them. On top of this, although the film did keep me interested for the first half, I found it began to drag as it went along, and especially in the third quarter it felt like they were just, you know, kind of like throwing twists in for the sake of them being there, which it made the film feel very repetitive. So for instance, I'll, I'll probably just say spoilers because this is quite a new film, okay, carrying on in three, two, one. At one point, Braddock decides to kill Antonio Banderos. This was clearly just done for shock value and was completely unnecessary. Or then we find out that Chloe is actually working for the bad guys, and honestly, this didn't make me gasp, it just made me roll my eyes. 
And to be honest, in general, I actually felt the writing for Chloe's part in this film was very subpar, as she's essentially just has like one note. Right, so when we first meet her, we find out that she does not trust Sully and Nathan. Nathan tells them that they all need to trust each other in order to work together. Later on, Chloe says that, you know, she doesn't trust them and he reiterates this. Later still, Chloe is about to drown to death and Nathan Drake saves her. Then in the very next scene, she turns on them because she still can't trust them. Then later, they end up working together, but again she betrays them because she feels like she cannot trust them. Are you beginning to see why that might be really infuriating to watch? It just goes round and round in circles and there's like absolutely no evolution to that story whatsoever. And you might be thinking, but surely at the end of this film, the big thing is that they all learn to trust each other and they've learned a lesson. No, that's not even the case. The big message at the end of this film is that you should not trust anyone. That's literally the message. And then the film just kind of ends. And I mean, I'm sorry, but that's a rubbish message. Like, that's literally the film going, you know what's healthy? Having trust issues. The final issue I have with this film is the music. Like, in fairness, they do have the Uncharted music, which is undeniably good. I love the music in that game. But I also just don't feel like they use it enough. And then, when the film comes to an end, rather than playing the classic Uncharted theme... The theme that anyone who knows this series, you know, the very people who will be going to see this film, you know, love. They just play some weird, like, modern techno music instead. And, well, I mean, why? What on earth possessed them to make that choice? So, overall, look, there are some positives here. For instance, the opening scene at uh, the auction house and the cameo with Nolan North, you know, to name a few, are very nice nods to the games. On top of that, the, the scene during Nathan's childhood adds a certain level of emotional depth, and parts of the adventure even feel like national treasure. All of these are, are really good aspects. However, on the downside, I really wasn't convinced by Tom Holland's betrayal of Nathan Drake. There were one too many unnecessary twists in the third quarter. There were some very odd musical choices, and the whole story about trust was a big misfire. I will emphasise that I'm coming at this from the viewpoint of someone who loves the games. There's a good chance if you've never played them, if you don't really know much about them, you can probably look past a lot of the things I'm saying, and that's absolutely fair. You know, that's fair enough. But for me personally, there are one too many issues for me to give this a top score. I still think this was an okay film, don't get me wrong, but I, I feel it could have been a lot better. I am going to give the Uncharted film, a 5.5 out of 10. Thank you very much for listening to this 100th episode. I certainly hope you've enjoyed it. And well, if you have, why not like, subscribe, leave a comment. Um, let's say you run a cinema. You know how they have music playing at, um, at the beginning before a film as people kind of like filter in? Why not just play an episode of the Mummy Movie Podcast instead? I give you full permission to do that. Or, um, I don't know, let's say you're a hypnotist. After you've done, um, you know, drinking the blood of your patient, I, I don't know why, whenever I think of hypnotists, I always think of Dracula. I'm just going to go with it, sure. This hypnotist happens to be Dracula, right. So you've just finished uh, drinking some of their blood, they're under your spell. You could then say to them, you will listen to the Mummy Movie Podcast. I really hope that voice doesn't sound too racist. Okay, let's just go with it anyway. And they will repeat in a slow voice. I, I will listen to the Mummy Movie Podcast. And then you will follow this up by going. You will recommend the Mummy Movie Podcast to all your friends and family. And they will repeat. I will recommend the Mummy Movie Podcast to all my friends and family and then you will say and you are back in the room i don't even know what accent that was oh damn this is this part's going to age terribly uh, <laughs> and then slowly anyway yeah anyway and then slowly they will come to and go huh oh, i really want to learn more about ancient egypt 
but in a fun way with a host that has terrible tastes in films. I'm I'm leaving this analogy here. Yeah, I, I think that's for the best. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for listening and join me next week where we shall be looking at the Aztec Mummy from 1957. I hope you all have a fantastic week and see you then. 